This week on A Lively Experiment, we will soon know who is going to be on the ballot for the first congressional district race this fall. And more trouble for a prominent state senator. Will he hang on to his leadership position and his seat? A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program in Rhode Island PBS. Joining us for the analysis, retired URI political science professor Maureen Moakley, Steve Frias, national committee man for the Rhode Island Republican Party, and WPRI politics and business editor Ted Nisi. Welcome to A Lively Experiment. I'm Jim Hummel. It is great to be back with you again this week. With a little over seven weeks left until the September primary, candidates for the first congressional district seat, more than 30 of them have been busy getting enough signatures to get on the ballot. But when the field is finally set next week, then what can we expect over the next two months at a time when voters are not particularly engaged? Uh, Ted, we are engaged, but this seems to be not the great. If you had one or two words or a phrase to describe this race, how would you describe it? Sleepy is what I've been using. I mean, I know the candidates, they get mad at me when they hear me say that because they, they all feel like they're working their tails off fundraising and meeting voters, et cetera. But, you know, I, I just think, so I've, this is the third congressional race in Rhode Island I've covered since I got my job at Channel 12. And the Cicilline race back in 2010 and last year's Magazine or Fung race, the stakes felt very high. It felt like people were super engaged. Doesn't feel anything like that this year. I have to think that's partly because people do not expect there's a risk the seat flips parties and affects the balance of power in Washington. And it's really just about which Democrat does Rhode Island want right, to send. Right, like the buzz with Langevin and I mean uh, with uh, Langevin seat with uh, with Fung and Magazina. Yeah, but the interesting thing about this is, and I think that's why it's perceived as so sleepy, is that <clears throat> first of all, a lot of these candidates aren't in it to win. I mean, they're there because they want to enhance their brand. In other words, if you're a council person, well, then you can run for the legislature, legislature statewide, or at the very least, secure your base. Mm -hmm. So there, there's so many things going on. I mean, in other words, it's hard to say because it's so unfocused. It will be after Tuesday. It will be. So I think that's or will it? Because if you have, yeah. even mm -hmm. if you if you have 15 Democrats on the ballot mm -hmm. and. You know, 10 or more of them have some claim to credibility because they're already an elected official yeah, or they have right? good fundraising. I don't know how, you know, forget the press corps. I don't know how the voters are going to. I do think voters can get fatigued and a little overwhelmed with that many people that they feel like they have a responsibility to vet. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're taping on a Thursday morning. The, uh, the deadline is Friday. The Secretary of State's office has said they should certify, make sure that everybody's in or out by the end of the day Tuesday. So this time next week we'll be knowing about it. Uh, the problem with the race to me, and I know I'm a Republican, <laughs> so there's a bias here. We'll get to your people in just I, I a know, second. I, I have my issues, too. But um, basically, they don't stand out from each other. You know, in a race, sometimes the people have run on an issue. Maybe they're running about health care. Maybe they're running about education. They all sound similar. They, they have, some of them have similar backgrounds. Um, the biggest fights they have is about who's going to be the mama that's going to be endorsed by the mama pack. Mm -hmm. They have arguments over, like, Regenberg didn't get play well in the sandbox with other young Democrats. I mean, this stuff is, like, kind of yeah, silly. Who cares about that when you're yeah. paying uh, $4 for whatever, a gallon of milk? But the thing is, it, it's going to focus in. In other words, after next week, you'll have some dropouts. And then, you know, these kind of skirmishes go on all the time. But it's just, people can't take it seriously until they know that there's some serious candidates. It, what it reminds me of is a race I covered across the border, since our TV market includes Massachusetts, which was the 2020 race to replace Joe Kennedy, um, which not only was it totally overshadowed by Kennedy and Markey running for you against each other for Senate in mm. Mass, but it truly just felt like people didn't care that much who represented mm. them in Congress. Mm. Everyone was a generic was Democrat. Was that the one that Auchincloss won? That was won? What, which yeah. Jake Auchincloss won. And it, right. uh, you know, frankly, I think to Steve's point in this race, everyone among the main candidates is running as kind of a generic Democrat, maybe with the exception of Regenberg, who's running as a little further to the left mm -hmm. um, Democrat, uh, but who won't make too, too much trouble, I think. You know, so for the voters, it's like, 
pick, you know, you have, you have 10 flavors of vanilla. Which one do you want, maybe? Mm -hmm. what, what have the discussions been? And I know there's hand wringing going on. What do you do about debates? You guys have always yeah. led the way in debates. What's the, what's the line of demarcation? Well, you know, in some ways, it's out of, a piece of it's out of our hands because Channel 12 has been owned by Nexstar, the biggest TV company uh, in the country now for a number of years. They have set national standards. They're on our website. You can see them. You well, have so to hit. In, in light, in lightness, is it fundraising? Is it's, it polling? It, it, there's it? like, <laughs> I have a spreadsheet because there's like 12 metrics. But the main ones I'd say are, first of all, you have to make the ballot. Then you have to hit at least $50,000 in uh, receipts to your campaign. Yeah. If there's polling, we look at polling, you know, and then it's, do you have, do you have an actual campaign office? Things like that. Now, again, the threshold isn't that, that high. So I wouldn't be surprised if we had over a dozen people qualifying for debate, should they all still be in the race. Uh, and we, we've, no joke, we're talking about borrowing, maybe we need to borrow par podiums from our sister stations in Connecticut, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. It's lavalier it, microphones. Yeah, my bigger, yeah, mm -hmm. my bigger uh, concern, and I'll just be honest with the viewers on here, and you will understand this, Jim, is, is how you find a format that's actually useful to the voters when you think about you have, let's say, 52 minutes, 50 minutes of, ta mm -hmm. of debating mm -hmm. time in an hour broadcast. You divide that up by nine people, you're not going to have a lot of big exchanges. So I, Tim and I are still, frankly, just trying to figure, puzzle that ourselves. I think they should just ask a question and say, raise your hand, do you hate Trump? <laughs> and they all raise their hand. Who hates Trump well, the but, most? But think of that, their though. Hand. I mean, during, this is what happened in 16. How many candidates did they have? I mean, Trump, it was all a free-for-all at right, the end. Right. But there were at least 10 or 12, right? I think there were 16 in those, in those debates at one point. Republicans, yeah. yeah. Yep. So but what, I, think it, I, I do think that... Um, It'll winnow down, and I think you'll figure out who's more serious, but I think you're right. In other words, with all those candidates, a debate is not going to be that instructive. You know, one line, two lines, and that kind of thing. And so um, <clears throat> that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. So, Steve, let's get to your candidate, Mr. Leonard. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was stunned. Look, I know the Republicans have a hard enough time getting public traction. There was no press allowed at his event. So if somebody announces and the reporters are not there to cover it, is it really an event? Well, I'll say it this way. Um, I tend to be a Republican that gets along okay with the media and has no problem talking to the media. Some Republicans are almost see the media as adversarial. And so they're almost concerned about how. Keep having, looking at me, Steve. I mean, I'm just. I'm, <laughs> what, what, because we have tough, tough, tough questions. questions. <laughs> it's because the whole mantra of like the media is liberal and the media will build a narrative, and so Republicans sometimes are concerned about uh, talking with the media because they feel that it'll be, uh, they'll be slanted in a certain way. Now, I don't think that's an excuse because basically when you're running for public office, you gotta talk to the Bring public, and, yeah. and number one, and then number two, if you're the minority party in a state like ours, there's only really one way to get your message, well, two ways to get your message out. Either raise the money, which is hard, or use their media. Get your message out from talking to the, to the, to the, to the news reporters and such. So I don't think it was a good strategy. I understand there may have been some cautious in that, caution in that camp about, about is he ready to talk to the media at length and be interviewed. But um, basically, I think that if you're going to be running for public office, you got to be ready to talk he to the public. A, he has a great resume, too. Absolutely. You know, it's not my, like he's a weak candidate. No, one no, of my no. biggest confusions to me as a reporter, again, who's covered now quite a few races with Mr. Leonard on the Republican side, but many of the Democrats, too, is wh why not just call a news conference the day you kick off your campaign? That is, you work, you know, you know how TV newsrooms are, Jim. If someone's having a kickoff, you're almost certainly going to try to get a in camera the there. In the summertime. In the summertime. Yeah, going on. And it's your, it's almost, your, almost your one moment, particularly if you're an underdog, that you can probably get the TV cameras there because we'll put something on the 6 o'clock news, even if it's just a, a sot, as a vosot, as we say. Yeah, and the other thing about this is, you know, when you, starting with this campaigning, uh, this high, whole idea of Mike Stenhouse uh, encouraging the Republicans, you know, mm -hmm. to vote in the Democratic primary. You could get some wacky results here. I mean, when you think about it, think about Casey. He was the one, mm -hmm. Representative Casey. He, um, he was the force behind the fireman's bill, the fireman disability bill. So he's, he's got the fireman, okay? Mm -hmm. And if he gets, he, and he's pro-gun, anti-choice. So, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility yeah, that's, that that's, he could be a contender. I mean, really. And that puts 
a reasonable Republican. I guess the question is, how many voters know who Steve Casey is outside one socket right now? Yeah, but in other words, he's got to get... But if you've got the Republicans mobilized to... Well, the the whole thing with with Steve... Steve Casey is actually the most interesting story of the CD1 primary, to me, because he is pro-life, because he is pro-Second Amendment. But when you do these sorts of things, if you're going to... Basically, it's almost like a rage. You're trying to get conservatives (laughs) into voting the Democratic primary. And it can be done, but when it's done, it's usually done successfully because it's go under the radar screen. Like, for example, with 2006 uh, with Chafee and Laffey, Laffey, there was about 5,000 Democrats, I will tell you, that became independents to vote in that primary to vote for Ch- uh, Chafee to beat Laffey, and that was the margin difference. It happened in 1976 with Noel and Lauber, where a few hundred Republicans came out and voted for Lauber over Noel in the U.S. Senate primary, and Lauber won. And so it can be done, but you got to do it kind of stealthy. you got to be under the radar you can't screen. Make the announcement. You can't make the announcement say, hello, <laughs> conservatives, come out and vote, and then all of a sudden all the Democrats get revved up and stuff like that. So, But he may, you make a great point because they're going to be so, this, this race, what do you figure, 10, 12, 15,000 votes? To win it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ten, ten in, the thousand. Prim- in the primary. Yeah, in the primary, 10,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. might be enough to win it. Yeah. 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 Didn't Laffey have something else in one of his ra- uh, mayor's races, too? There was some crossover stuff going was, on. That was an example where the unions overplayed their hand in that race. That was 2004. He won it by 2-1. to one. It was like 8,000, 3,000 mayoral primary. And they tried to get people And they to tried crossover. to get people. And then so what happened is Laffey used that to mobilize general voters, general election voters, to come out and vote for him in a Republican primary, which is extremely unusual, to defeat a union move to remove him from office. Let's talk about some of the candidates at the top. Uh, you know, just off the top of my head, Aaron Regenberg, Sabina Matos, Sandra Cano seems to be making some ground. Gabe Amo. Um, beyond that, who is who is on your radar screen in the upper tier? Don Carlson yeah. from Jamestown, just because of money, um, obviously. And then then you get into kind of the question marks. Steve Casey is one of them. You have a number of officials who currently hold elective office, have shown the ability to run a campaign, um, understand politics. Uh, Casey, Ana Quesada. Um, who else is on that list? John Gonsalves out of Providence, mm-hmm. uh, Rep. Marvin Abney. But again, in the case of, for example, Abney, he's run, he's done so little other than pull papers and say he's running. Mm-hmm. How serious is he? Yeah, you know? and even mm-hmm. after the, you thought, okay, get, let's get the legislative session out. Raymond Bakari, uh, who was a panelist on this um, mm-hmm. uh, Rhode Island College uh, editor of the Anchor, is having a Zoom thing next week. Abney still had not responded yet. And I thought, that's what, it's, you don't have to leave your living room to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's, and that's a thing. So you have, so I think, I, I don't, I thought some of these folks weren't even going to pull papers. They had just kind of put their name out there, see if right. they get a get the buzz going or yeah. whatever. But everyone pulled papers, and so a ton of them are turning in the 500 signatures as we tape this. So, so we'll have to see yeah, about but that. But with seven weeks left, so Don Carlson, you make an interesting right. point, right. and a lot of people say, oh, money shouldn't buy the election. Mm. Wh- where does he spend that money? And when is he going to start spending that money? Well, he'd have to, I mean, obviously he's got to do it on television. I mean, you know, it's interesting because Matt House, Or does he? Well, I don't know. I mean, Matos has over two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and she's—I mean, she's going to be on air. That's going to be her strategy, and it's probably a pretty good one, given the given the margins of difference and so forth. Um, that poll that was done—it uh, wasn't her poll, but it was certainly a poll that benefited her. I mean, she's looking for negative ads, so I think she can run a very competent campaign. Via the media. With all due respect to your station, though, it's not as many people, and I'm a former TV guy, not watching. Is it more social media? Is it YouTube? Is well, it, but you've got to think about the difference. General You're not voter. trying to reach the general public. Who's the median voter in a race that's going to get this low of turnout in a special election? Mm-hmm. It's an older electorate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, you are actually, you are still, and I'm not just speaking from my shop, but, you know, when you think about who's more likely to still be watching TV news and local broadcasts, mm-hmm. the older demographic is, and that's also who votes. I mean, I think in last year's primary ARP did an analysis that over half the people who voted were over the age of 50 and some large percent were over 60. So, you know, yes, you're not going to reach a ton of young people broadcasting on TV, but they're probably not going to show up to vote either. Yeah. And if you have a lot of airtime, that can make a big difference as yeah. far as she, her she's concerned. Okay. So uh, come back next week because we'll know exactly who is on mm-hmm. the ballot. And then Ted and Tim can try to figure out how to <laughs> weed it out from there with next star's assistance. Um, Senator Josh Miller, the gift that keeps on giving for those mm-hmm. of us who are covering politics. For those of you who haven't followed it, short version, longtime senator winds up admitting to keying somebody's uh, car in the parking lot at Garden City. His story changed with the police. He is now facing the news peg is obstruction of justice charges. The leadership of the Senate, Steve, has been eerily, not eerily, but just maybe disturbingly quiet on this. Yeah, I mean, it's its kind of like when I saw that, it was one of the most infantile things I ever saw in my life. 
basically. And you have three kids. And I have three kids. And if one of my kids did this in Garden City and they hang out there a lot of times, there'd be a lot of trouble at home. They'd be in stocks, <laughs> okay? right? Yeah, you do it in the state house, and all of a sudden people are like, you know, no comment, nothing to see here. And basically the problem is, is that, you know, as we know Senator Ruggiero has had legal problems in the past, and one of them was keying a car 30 years ago. So I think that's making him reluctant to call out what this is, which is obviously somebody who got triggered by a bumper sticker that said Biden sucks, mm -hmm. decided to key a car, and then lie about it to the police. And the lying about it to the police is just as bad as keying the car in the first place. If he had just fessed up and said, you know what, moment of whatever, and it's a disorderly uh, well, conduct you know. charge. But the other thing is, let's keep, let's keep a little perspective here. Mm -hmm. Do you really think, I mean, these are misdemeanor charges. Let's keep right. that in, it, it shows very poor judgment. And he should be held accountable as far as the law is concerned. And his constituents should have something to say. But I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't expect a lot of people in the Senate to come out and yell for him to resign. Because he's I don't a, think because that's... He's, because he's a Democrat. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you the omerta of the General Assembly, oh, right? Like, you you like, do not criticize fellow members yeah, almost no matter what they and do. And as I say, these are misdemeanors. They're infantile and they... They display a sign of quirky character, a flaw in character. Is the obstruction charge a misdemeanor or is that a felony? No, it's both. I knew it's a misdemeanor because the solicitor is deciding it. I think, I guess, I, I have to admit I disagree with Maureen because I think watching a state lawmaker lie to police on video mm -hmm. is is quite a sight. Um, and again, it's partly the rise of having these police body-worn cameras where we would just be reading a police report in years past about this incident. Maybe it would be a little murkier, but you're watching Josh Miller fib and change his story in real time on those videos. Uh, I, it's true. It's just, quote unquote, just a misdemeanor, as Maureen says, and maybe people in his section of Cranston won't, won't think it's that bad, but I... I don't know. I think it's uh, certainly the reaction, the fact that it's made national news, the reaction you hear. I hear plenty of Democrats, uh, at least privately, say they're appalled that he didn't just, you know, fess up and he tried to play it off. But, you know, yeah, we'll no, see. I mean, I, I think it's appalling and I understand that. But I wouldn't expect the leadership at this point. I don't fault them for asking him to resign. I so, don't think so, that would be something he, he do. But he should have Look, for, let me give you an example of the state house. Mm -hmm. So a few months ago, we had a state rep who mm -hmm. asked a stupid question of another state rep about basically, you a pedophile. Mm -hmm. And for one week, there was a complete fiasco up there right, being, Bob about Bob Carcrochi. And, and eventually the speaker removed him from the committee. Mm -hmm. At a minimum, Senate President Ruggiero should remove him as chairman. I agree of, that. Of the, of Which the, I asked uh, yesterday, and they declined to comment on removing him as chairman. Do you think but that's I because think... Mr. Quattrochi was a Republican? Well, there we go. <laughs> and it's like, in Cranston, we had this, of course, you, you know, this councilman um, who was found with, that was a misdemeanor, possession of, of crack cocaine. Within days, the Democrats are calling him for the resign. Everybody was going bananas about him resigning, and he resigned. This guy, Josh Miller, lies to the police, and, and basically people are like, well, you know, leave it to the constituents. And now, the, one yeah. thing I just will add is I do think part of the dynamic is the fact that they're out of session. Because if you remember when Ruggiero That's got pulled point. over for suspected DUI and Chacon was with You're him. there every and, day, And right? Chacon was after, you know, was yeah. like threatening the pensions of the officers. Piva Weed had to take Chacon off the Labor Committee chairmanship. Yeah. But as you say, reporters were there every day with them because mm -hmm. they were in session. Ruggiero's people are even basically saying, like, well, we, we can't technically remove him right now because we'd have to be in session for us to put in the thing that removes him. So, Maureen, last question on this. If it goes through, and mm -hmm. let's say he either reaches a plea or he's found guilty or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. does that cost, at the very least, cost him his leadership? Probably should now. Does that cost him his seat, do you think? I don't think so. Really? I, I think he's got a, he's got a, he, he has a strong constituency. He represents a piece of, you know, he's a very progressive legislator and they seem to, um, I, I think he's been very popular. Now, I don't know, but I, I would suspect it wouldn't cost him a seat. Do you think it cost him a seat? Uh, only in a Democratic primary. I mean, that seat is pretty Democratic. Mm -hmm. So it would be in a primary. Could he be toppled by a young progressive coming along um, and using this as an issue, like he's an embarrassment? Possibly. All right. I don't know. Uh, one thing that we got to, you know, we were off last week, but uh, right at the end of the session, uh, there's a bill that went through, some call it uh, controversial, the firefighters hypertension bill. Now, there was a bill proposed that um, firefighters should be able to get lifetime disabilities for post-traumatic stress disorder. That went down. The hypertension bill, though, Marine went through, despite the, the, the head scratcher on this is, Dan McKee is a former mayor. He, he talks about the mayors, the mayor cabal, and he basically said, well, you know what, I didn't listen. Oh, I, they didn't argue hard enough on yeah, this Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I talked to one legislator that said that <clears throat> we did the wrong thing 
in terms of supporting the bill. But we expected the governor to do the right thing in <laughs> yeah. terms of vetoing it's it. Wait to minute. give them cover? Yeah. To, yeah. But Dan wait McKee a minute. Will be, Dan McKee will be the no. He can be the bad guy. He can say the well, no. Well, okay. But the thing is that... Profiles I mean, encourage it. Gina, Gina Raimondo did the same thing. Yeah. And she vetoed it, and they didn't override it. That's and right. the ex expectation was he would veto it, and they wouldn't override it. But, but I mean, he should have... You know, I thought it was a lack of leadership. I know it's tough. You don't want to mess with the firefighters. But still, that bill is appalling. I mean, I, I was I was sincerely surprised on this one because as you say, Jim, there is truly nothing more synonymous with Dan McKee than I am I love the mayors. I was right. a mayor. Mayors, 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 mayors. And Charlie Bombardi's <laughs> crying from the rooftop. Right. right. And and I mean the, Obviously, the idea that Dan McKee was not aware of this bill when it's come up before. I'm not, they didn't talk enough to they him. They didn't tell him no. enough it's to crazy. veto it. Or, and he does said it was veto-proof. But, you know, I think the other thing is we've seen that. We've seen with governors, the more a governor just sort of says, well, the General Assembly, I can't. I can't get too involved. They've already passed it with a veto-proof majority. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's actually withdrawing some of your power because, as Maureen mm -hmm. astutely points out, part of the game up there is Ruggiero and Shikarchi and some reps hold their nose maybe on a bill they don't really want to become law, knowing the governor is going to veto it and take the heat, which Gina Raimondo did, uh, but it do they don't override it, so it doesn't actually become law. If Dan McKee doesn't play his part in that, now it's law. And play yeah, that scenario out. Let's say he does veto it. So, look, he's one year into his term. If he right. uh, irritates the unions or whatever, he can take the bad guy, and then he gives cover to the guys that he's got to do deals with the next yeah. It's a win-win to yeah. me yeah. if he does that. I, I, you know, I really, I really question his leadership. I really think that was uh, that and the way they behaved with the um, Cranston Armory. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the thing in Philadelphia. I mean, that was bad enough. He should have known about it. But the idea that... You know, and I don't care what people eat for lunch at the Capitol Grill, thank you very much. It's not really that important. But if they take a $500 check at the lunch towards his campaign, and then he let this thing go. I mean, it seems to me like it's a really good project. And I think he's backing off a little because he's embarrassed about all this. But I really think, you know, I thought he was doing a reasonable job. But I, I, I don't know. He hasn't struck struck me as being a strong leader. The problem with Dan McKee, and this is actually one of the saddest chapters of Dan McKee, is that he started out in 2014 as a strong pro-mayor kind of uh, guy running for lieutenant governor who was in, the unions refused <laughs> to endorse. They endorsed the Republican. They endorsed the Republican. That's Very true. rare. Within eight years, he has transformed, and this is a major milestone, that transformation from someone who, who looked out for the local taxpayers mm -hmm. to someone who is now bought and paid for by the special special interests, who is just interested in how do I get reelected. In the old days, we had party bosses. And what party bosses wanted was somebody strong enough to win an election day, weak enough to control after the election. Now we have union bosses. And Dan McKee is controlled by the union bosses, as shown by that vote. By, by excuse me, by failing to veto that bill. Yeah, and think of that because it, I mean, I just it just all came together as you were describing that he was Mr. Charter School. They wanted nothing to do with it. Bob Walsh, NEA, was one of his inside guys running the campaign. Yeah, and Bob, yeah. you know, there was actually talk Bob might join the inner circle. Now, Bob is also a Cumberland guy, which is also a big, right. important yeah, yeah, way right, to get right, in the inner exactly. circle with Dan McKee. But yeah, I just, again, more than anything, I just, there's, you know, most politicians, there are certain things that you know that is core to them and they, you don't think they're going to do trades on. You know, mm -hmm. Gina Raimondo, maybe it was the pension reform or some mm -hmm. of the economic development mm -hmm. stuff. I did think for Dan McKee it was anything that the municipal leaders cared a lot about. He was going to stand up for them because he talks about it so much. So I, that's, again, I'm, I'm not... I was sincerely surprised. And they were there for him during the election. Yes. Oh, yes, they, in a big they, way. They, they made primary. a big difference yes. in that election. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What does he have to do to get his footy back, do you think, Maureen? He's well, had so know. many stumbles. I think, I mean, in my opinion, first of all, he should, he should pick up on this uh, Cranston Armory thing and start being positive about doing some development. I mean, I get notices. He cuts ribbons every day. He's always mm -hmm. at all these things. So he's out there and so forth. But he's got to show some... Uh, He's got to throw some strong leadership on some issues as they come up. He's got time. In other words, yeah, he, you know, years. that was the other thing. It wasn't like he was up for election right. in mm. four months. Right. Uh, but he, he's got some mending to do as far as his, his persona and his, the visions of his leadership. Yeah, the four-year term something. gives you the cover. 
And yeah. in this case, he didn't use it. Yeah. And we don't actually know. He might not run right. for re-election, exactly. right? He'll be six years in, basically, in the next election. Yeah, and he's going to be in he his mid-70s. Yeah, early exactly. 70s. So all the more yeah. reason you'd think right. this was one so f- anyway. That you could, yeah, that you could do. Let's um, let's do outrages and or kudos. Ted, let's begin with you this week. My outrage is actually at Elon Musk, because as oh. someone who actually thought Twitter has always been pretty great, despite its flaws, um, forget all the stuff about censorship and, you know, politics and everything. Put that to one side. He just keeps breaking the technology that has made Twitter useful over the years, the ways to track tweets from the people who put interesting stuff up and, uh, you know, limiting how many you can read. And I find it frustrating because I think he's taking something useful and making it worse and costing himself money in Ted, the process. Ted, you were on the verge of a nervous breakdown when you thought Twitter was going under. Yeah, I mean, it's just, well, and I just think, look, it's... now, are you threads? I did join threads, yeah, but, you know, people make the very valid point. Do we want to give Mark Zuckerberg even more control of everyone's (laughs) online lives? But... If Musk is refusing to even create a functional system technologically, I don't know. It just it just seems like a rich person with a toy who decided to break something that was useful to a lot of people. The most ba- that's, exa- that's exactly right. You I know? completely agree with you. The most baffling thing to me was limiting. If you have something where you have advertisers, don't you want more It's like eyeballs? a slot machine. It's an addicting service. Yeah, you don't sorry, you could only give us X number yeah. of dollars. You don't go to Bally's and they're like, oh, stop with the slot machine, please. Yeah, really, you know, that's what Twitter uh, We is. won't change your money anymore, exactly. sir. And there's another, bi- there's another billion dollar lawsuit coming out from the people yeah. he owed back pay to. He paid $44 billion dollars for the thing. And it's worth the value it at 15 now yeah, or something? It's bad. It's bad. Yeah. So anyway, it just seems, it just seems unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's the indulgence of the very rich. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Steve, okay. what do you have this week? Oh, my outrage, you probably could have guessed from my earlier comments <laughs> earlier, was about the lack of outrage over Josh Miller. Uh, when the Senate leadership does nothing can't even say that they're going to remove him from the chairmanship after keying a car of somebody who simply has a bumper sticker on their car that says Biden sucks and then lies to the police so blatantly, coming up with ridiculous comments like gun nuts. And there is zero outrage. When a Republican does something in this state, whether it's like being caught with crack cocaine in this car, there's automatic outrage, automatic calls for resignation, or they say something stupid, there's calls to remove him from their committee seat. And this guy is just gliding along, and we're just supposed to ignore it. And that's the problem, is that people do not have enough outrage over what their public officials do at times. Have the Republican legislators come out and ask for his... Um, the Republican Joe Powers Party, did. The Republican, yeah. power, the Republican Party has yeah, called for Yeah, the party did. I know that. But and, I wonder and, about the legislators. I, I, I don't know what the legislators have done. And to be honest with you, the problem with some of that stuff up the state house is everybody does not like to say bad things about the other up there. Yeah. And it's well, what Ted said. It's okay, it, it, okay, and yeah. I really don't care about that stuff. Yeah. So I care about that's this. why they didn't want you get elected. Yeah, that's exactly why <laughs> they want me up right, there. Right, right. But I'm just saying, just call it the way it is. That was yeah. a blessing that you lost. <laughs> 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 we were going to say the mail ballot guy. Yeah. Uh, okay, what do you so have? I have a funny segue uh, a resulting <laughs> of that. Okay, it's more a, a slight kudos for our legislature, okay? I want, when you look at <clears throat> the national scene, when you look at what's going on in Kansas, in, um, in Iowa. Iowa, when you look at what's going on in Tennessee, and when you look at these fierce partisan divisions where it's, you know, it's really raucous and it's really, it's not representative. And one of the interesting things here is, it's, a, it's the amorta, I guess, suppose, <laughs> but the thing is, it's a, more or less civil kind of exchange. I mean, I know there's underlying deals. I'm, not, I'm aware of that. But one of the interesting things is there was some research that was done that Adam Myers pointed out. We have the least ideologically divided, uh, one of the least ideologically, ideologically divided legislatures in the country. So you have, you know, you have Republicans and Democrats. Just Steve's caught. horror, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve wants more of that. Come on. No, the point is to have a choice. Yeah. All right. But anyway, so relatively speaking, I would say that we should be grateful for uh, the level of civility and uh, that goes on up there. All right. Thank you so much, Go, uh, folks. It's a quick half hour. We're glad to be back to, with you after the Independence Day holiday. Ted, good to see you. Uh, keep us track on uh, social media <laughs> and uh, Maureen and Steve. Uh, folks, we will have much more clarity on the CD1 race next week. Come back for that and all the analysis of the news that happens over the next seven days as a lively experiment continues. Have a great weekend. A 
lively experiment is generously underwritten by. Hi, I'm John Hazen White Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.